Everybody, happy RVA soccer weekend. And we're talking about you know another quality kicker's performance. We said if you were with us last week, we said we like doing these podcasts. So let's do it again. Uh, I'm Matt here, helping, helping to host this episode, and I got a uh, good friend Kate with me. Kate, how's it going? It's good. I finished out this RVA soccer day with an RVA with the RVA soccer weekend and went and watched the academy game today at City Stadium. It it was a whole lot of fun. There was it was a pretty quality product from both teams out on the field. Um free to get in. Um yeah, really enjoyed it. Two goals from Nick Simmons. You love to see it. Good day at the office. Yeah. We're gonna be talking about you know two goals from Richmond Kickers players throughout you know this episode as well because uh, much like uh, the young ones did you know today you get into two one win so did the kickers you know got a two one win at one Knoxville on Saturday night uh, you know big win you know uh, I'm talk, talking about streaks this you know league and then Jaeger Cup and league and Jaeger Cup completely throws me out two wins in a row you know gets them off you know the league snide a little bit and you know really you know i think showing that teams starting to put some building blocks together and you know i don't think either of these wins have been fluky wins in any way you know games where it looks like there's been a game plan going out there they've been able to execute and yeah you know, i think as fans that's what we want to be able to you know, see that you know there's something intentional you know that's going well so yeah. Yeah. So, so let's get, you know, might as well start off with uh, reviewing, you know, the lineup. Uh, looks strikingly similar, you know, to the Tormenta game. Uh, good old, you know, mantra of if it's not broke, don't fix it, uh, except for Maxi, who, you know, was not in the team. Hopefully that's nothing, you know, serious. Uh, but Ryan Sierkowski came into the lineup, you know, for him. Uh, I wouldn't say it was an exact one for one swap because, I don't think anybody who's watched the team is going to accuse those two guys of playing the same style and playing the same way. Uh, but, okay, what were your thoughts with the 11 that uh, Darren picked this time? Well, I will say when we all backed Fob Mob, we did immediately think, okay, Fob Mob got it wrong again. What What's going on here? Is Sierkowski really playing left wing back? Uh, maybe maybe we'll see this sort of get sorted out. But no, this appears to be how the kicker's actually set up. It was a bit – we haven't necessarily seen – been expecting um, a 3-4-3 three, three from them, um, especially with three center backs. Um, we haven't really – this this seems to be a, a, a newer experiment. But, yeah, exactly. If it, it's not broken, um, don't fix it because it does seem to be getting a lot of the players who are pretty in form on the field at the same time, which the complaints about that. And especially with how the team started, I think that says a lot about this lineup. Maybe it's a bit unusual. It's hard for other teams to set up their team because it's such a departure from maybe a typical Darren side. So um, definitely um, glad to see that we, that mob was not wrong for once that their player positioning yeah. uh, ended up being accurate. Yeah, something about a broken clock twice a day, right? Uh, and, and I think the thing that helps with this you know, new formation, so, uh, you know, review, you know, had a nominal back three of, uh, you know, Franca, Griffin Garnett, and Dakota Barnathan, uh, and then Simon Fix, you know, playing, you know, right wing back, you know, right midfield. Again, a lot of this comes down to semantics of how you want to classify something. Uh, and then, yeah, Sierkowski, you know, out on uh, the left side. So I think with this set of personnel, even, you know, if you wanted to shift over to a back four, it's not hard to have Simon shift over and, you know, you know, gear, you know, really probably any of the three shift out left. 
and you know be able to play a traditional you know four four two four three three whatever uh, you want to you know, move towards. So I think a little bit of the flexibility you know, starts to you know, integrate you know more too, and uh, it's not like it's uncommon in world soccer these days to you know see you know teams use four center backs. That's I think the latest you know pepism of everything. And I mean if we got the guys you know, to do it, why not do it? Yes, I will say I in my personal belief, because as soon as we moved on our fourth center back in the 86th minute, I did have this on my own time. Um this brought me straight back to the 2021 um Euros when Taylor Twelman said that Belgium needed to bring on not a fourth defender, but a fourth center back specifically. So I think maybe uh, Martinez, the Belgian manager, or Taylor Twelman himself might have been the originator of this radical four center back back line. Who, ne- who needs outside backs in this day and age? Why not play all our center backs at once? I, I think... I think the kickers are really they're building off of a program as illustrious as as um, in this tradition of four center backs. Yeah. Nathan Ani, Chris Cole, come on down. Six center back rotation. We're coming Why not? for you. Hey, it look, it's gonna seem obvious, but the shift to this has really helped to clean up the defensive leaks that were happening you know, before as well. Uh, but we'll get into all that. Let, instead of talking about you know, goals that you know we've conceded in the past, let's talk about goals that the kickers scored you know, this week. And they did not waste any time you know, getting into it. Uh, on the score sheet, you know, Chandler is striker, you know, Kate's number one man, uh, you know, right there scoring you know, the quintessential Chandler O'Dwyer goal. Uh, but even before that, you know, happened. You know, that man again, Adrian Bilhart, you know, forcing another good save out of a keeper after some good interplay, you know, with Simon coming up, you know, the right side. You know, Kate, what did you kind of see with, you know, the build up and then, you know, bringing us into the goal itself? You know, actually, I just rewatched it. I think Chandler had that shot. Oh, so, Chandler? Yeah. I, because I rewatched it because I thought it was Bilhart as well. And then I rewatched it, and it turned Chandler actually took that rocket of a shot from inside the 18. I think he was played in by Bill Hurt, who then Chandler was in the box, Fox in the box, absolute rocket that the keeper pushed over the bar. That's a kicker's corner. Neil plays that in. Chandler scores a directly off the header. So really cool to see. We said last week we'd like whoever's in the center forward position to actually um, – Produce in that position. So uh, a center forward whose strike earns a corner that that forward then scores off of can't ask for more than that. So really liked seeing, yeah, how hot they started because I think from both our Richmond teams this year, uh, quick starts have not necessarily what we've gotten used to. Some second half teamism going on, um, sort of across the board. So it was very refreshing to sort of have the kickers come out hot, get that, to, to be taking shots early, um, put the keeper under pressure, put the line under pressure, and actually convert the chances when they come. Yeah, and, you know, I am I openly admit that I am nothing if not a very, very petty individual when it comes to my soccer. I loved it even more that, you know, Chandler, you know, just beat Jalen Chrysler to that spot to be able to head it in, you know. Keep, keep signing with Knoxville, yes. buddy. Yeah. <laughs> how's, how's that been treating you down there? So, yes, I, I will. Yeah. In, I didn't notice it in real time. Not going to pretend that I did, but watching it back on the replay, I was like, oh, look who's there. You're trailing, watching. Love it. Love it. Didn't get his hops up. Nope. Uh. Well, I did have a really nice segue to go from this, but now that you've uh, you know, informed me that it wasn't actually Bill Hart who took that shot, it kind of ruins that. But uh, what wasn't ruined was, you know, Chandler teeing up Adrian Bill Hart for, uh, I don't care what they say, his goal, you know, in the 18th minute. Yep. So this one, I think, also speaks to oh, playing quickly in that 
Chandler has played the ball in. He makes the sort of the run down the left side, cuts it quickly back to Adrian, who I think this speaks again to what we were talking about last week. This is a player in form. This is a player confident in his own abilities. Who's willing to take shots that might look a little lower probability, but you know what? You miss a hundred percent of the shots you never take. And he just one times it right past the keeper at the near post. So I think quick, simple passing and quick, uh, slightly audacious shots um, have shown good results for both the kids forward line and for Adrian Billhart specifically. So really liked seeing that because I think we've talked about how it feels like they're they're a little bit trying to walk it in or once they get into the 18 yard box, the, the ball just literally vanishes into the ether. No one knows where it goes. So just, just a few quick passes, shot, goal. That seems to be a pretty effective formula. Yeah, what, what I liked most about this one uh, was that the guys were making you know, runs, you know, where they were making it before anybody looked up and they were ready to pass the ball before they looked up to see if anybody was making the run. You know, starting from Chandler making you know the run uh, for Neil to play him through, uh, and then as soon as that you know first pass was happening, you you go back and watch the replay. You can see Adrian you know, starting to you know kind of circle around you know the box and setting himself up with you know to be able to receive that ball at the perfect you know angle you know, back from Chandler. Chandler knew exactly where to play it. You know, that shows that they've you know, something they've clearly been working on you know together because you don't you know start making that initial run you know when Neil's passing the ball if you don't have an idea of what you want to accomplish. Uh, and you know that spacing was perfectly right there. And yeah the, Adrian just hit the living hell out of that ball too. Uh, like he I love a player who can hit a heavy shot, and he hits heavy, you know, shots, you know, on target and on target. I like that part of it too. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, watching in real time, I thought it was one of those where you know the keeper got two hands on it; and it was just hit so hard he couldn't keep it out. Maybe he pushes it onto the post and still finds its way in. Uh, hopefully, the USL will fix this, but currently it's credited as an own goal to Sean Lewis. I think that might be a little harsh on the keeper right there, but also he doesn't want that. Adrian wants the goal. Make everybody happy. Yep. Right. Agreed. I I don't just based on the physics of it all. I don't really see how the keeper Lewis there makes any, how he somehow turns the ball into the way that it wasn't already happening through Adrian directly. So it's a bit of a confusing one. Right, like I understand when keepers get you know hit with an own goal and you know they miss the ball and it comes back you know off the crossbar off the post and hits them in the back and you know goes in. But the, the man made a well, he didn't make a save because goal, uh, but he got he definitely got his hands on the ball and that ball was definitely going in initially. And just like you don't you know give a defender an own goal if you know they try to you know, block it and deflect it if it was still going in anyway. I, I think this is Adrian's goal. Agreed. But you know what? If it keeps Chandler even with him on league goals, if they're both on three, that's good for my preseason golden boot prediction. So I guess I guess we gotta take the wins where we can. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Selfishly, so selfishly I'm coming out on top. <laughs> well all of us here are nothing if not self interested, you know, and all of our preseason picks, right? I'm, I know I have a few who actually want to lose them, uh, but there's other ones where, yeah, I'm like, I know I was hyping up Adrian in yeah, preseason, like, hey, this needs to be the guy's difference maker. And yeah, it gives me a little bit of a good feeling every time he scores where it's like, man, look, look at me. I might actually know something. Ignore all the ones that are terribly wrong that I predicted, but this one, yeah. Yeah. And even sometimes when you predict a golden boot a little bit as a joke, Maybe, maybe there's powers yeah. of manifestation of coming to play. What, what, that was it a joke? Maybe, <laughs> maybe it wasn't a joke at all. Oh, well, all right. it uh, it will be a joke if this is where it ends. But this is not where it ends, so no. it won't be a joke because it's actually extremely serious. Master motivator, Kate. Mm -hmm. right. Invest yeah. Chandler striker shot stocks now. They're only going to in, in price. 
There we go. There we go. Would love it if that comes true and you are correct in this. Uh, so yeah, the kicker's Mark, up to stop nothing. Scoring in, goals. Yeah, kicker's up to nothing in the 18th minute, though. I mean, I didn't you see that one coming. Didn't you know if you had you know said we're gonna be up two nil at any point in the game, or I could maybe get a late one, you know, to, you put uh it to bed, but I'm trying to think of you know what, maybe like the Tormenta game away last year was the last time the you know, kickers got out to a two nothing lead in non like open cup style competition. So it'd been a while and it feels good. Not gonna lie, kinda like it. Yeah. So uh one thing that was happening a lot in that first half with the two goal lead is uh referee very loose with uh you know the whistle very frequent with the cards. Yeah, so I for me, I think a lot of times I don't get too worried about if he's calling it you know, tighter, calling it loose as long as he's consistent. Uh but not really I was a little surprised that he was going you know, to you know the pocket that often in the first half. I feel like a lot of times refs you know try to you know keep you know, keep it light on that level in the first half. And then in the second half you get to the point where it feels like they'll call anything a yellow card foul, uh, especially as it gets later in the game. I don't think that's right, but it's kind of just the way it ends up going sometimes. But uh, yeah, a few a few guys end up in the book in the first half, which uh, certainly I think changes the way guys have to play or maybe not have to play should play. Yeah, two two a piece in the first half, which. Is, is unusual, I'd say, especially since I don't think the game as a whole was particular. I mean, it was a little chippy, but it, it wasn't necessarily descending into madness. So it did feel a little overcorrective, especially since the consequences of those cards, I don't think mapped on both for the lack of consequences for Knoxville and the consequences for Richmond mapped on to how the discipline in the game played out. I don't, I don't necessarily think there needed to be a red card in this game, but based on how it was refereed, the fact that there was only one red card, um, looking back, it, it, it doesn't feel um, even evenly applied. Yeah, and we will get to that in a little bit, but uh, yeah, lots of yellows going, you know, going around, you know, in that first half and carried over into the second half and. Didn't end up making a big difference uh, in this game, but mm, it might move for, move uh, make a little bit of difference next week. We'll get there though. Uh, so one thing one thing that wasn't a change you know, this week uh, that might have been a little bit of a surprise: uh, Pablo Jara you know, staying in net you know, this time around. And yeah, you know, I will fully own wasn't the biggest fan of his signing. He showed out really well tonight. Uh, tonight yesterday you know, at the game and, you know, including, you know, uh, helping to keep it down on what was just a real classic kind of pinball scramble, you know, late in the first half, you know, okay. What did you see on that, uh, you know, scramble where I feel like probably half the players on the field touched the ball within 10 seconds. Yeah. Uh, chaos and a whole lot of luck on the side of the kickers. Um, yeah, that's one of the ones where, you're just screaming at somebody to get their foot on the ball and actually get the ball out. And you were just bodies in the right place at the right time. Jara getting to the right place at the right time, a wicked deflection off the post that puts actually exemplifies the word pinball because it, the ball hit ricocheted back into the box about as far as it came out as from where it came in from in the first place. So, one definitely had us all with our head in our hands there for a second. Um, but I think there might've been some sort of curse on the goal on that end, because there was an eerily similar situation in the second half for the kicker. So I think there was just some sort of, some sort of goal, the tree end, as I've started calling it, um, because a lot of scrambles and I don't think a goal was scored in that, on that side. Was it? Not Saturday. No, no. But yeah, you know, Kicker, you know, got away with that one slash, you know, you know, made good emergency defending, you know, slash Knoxville 
sucked. Who cares? Didn't go in. Uh, and it pretty much gets the kickers, you know, to halftime at two nothing. And uh, I was feeling good, you know, going into halftime, you know, the way that they'd, you know, been playing. Having said that, I'm also, you know, a uh, battered kickers fan, you know, over the last you know, 12 months, and couldn't help but have in the back of my mind of, I feel like we've seen this story before. I feel like you know, we've had this good feeling going to halftime, and it comes with that caveat of, but. Tale of two halves is yeah. a story that many of us have seen before. And I think it, especially being a bright start, we've seen a lot of good first halves, maybe not necessarily this season, but last season we saw a lot of really good first half compared with absolutely abject second halves with no real ability to pinpoint what necessarily went wrong. So the two goal lead definitely was a burst of confidence, but you always have, yeah, you always have that in the back of your head. Like, all right, what sort of boneheaded decision is going to change the course of this one? And there was a boneheaded decision, but luckily it didn't change the course um, of the overall game. But I think what just like for both halves, the kicker's possession was 38% in the first half, dropping to 25% in the second. I don't know how much of that was maybe that last 10 or 15 minutes. Like if the the one-way traffic from, from Knox when we're up, up a man um, was able to have like a mass, like really swung the pendulum there, but um, very low possession stats overall, which uh, the kickers actually have been better this season when they've had lower possession. Uh, but yeah, definitely looking at those numbers, you got that in the back of your head that um, one, one defensive error, one, you know, one door opening means, all of a sudden we're looking at a very different result, but, but luckily, luckily it did not, it did not end up going away. Yeah. I think there's possession stats. You know, a lot of that does come down to game state, you know, sometimes because if you know, your team that needs you know, to score, you're probably going to be on the ball a little bit more. If you're up, especially if you're up two goals, you, know, you can you know be a little bit you know, more cautious. You can be you know, a little bit more uh, you know, content, you know, with holding your positioning, you know, making the other team, have, you know, try to break you down. And I think that's why, you know, in games when the results aren't going our way, we see the kickers with more, you know, possession because, you know, teams say, all right, here's the ball, try to break us down. And we're in, we're in league one, you know, where I think all things being equal and organized defense is going to outshine an attack. So, an increasingly yeah. desperate attack. Yeah. So I think, there's some rationale and reasoning. And then, like you said, you know, the last 15 minutes or so where uh, the kickers completely gave up, you know, on even pretending you know, to attack and just set up shop to get out of there can you know, till the tables a little bit further. Uh, but, you know, early in the second half, I'd say, you know, uneventful up until it became very eventful. Uh, so about, at 55th, 56th minute or so, uh, I cannot pronounce you know, the guy's name right. The Tequila you know, uh, guy you know, for Knoxville starts you know, prancing through the box a little bit. And he wins a penalty. So uh, yeah, James Vaughn goes you know, sliding in uh, and initially avoids him, but I think his, you know, his momentum continued to take him through. And I thought it was a pretty obvious penalty. Yeah. Especially we talk a lot about things that happen at this level that you might not see at a, another. And a lot of times at this level, refs don't call anything in the box. They're too afraid of being seen as influencing the outcome of the game to make any sort of marginal or borderline decisions. So when something even as relatively, I think anywhere else on the field, that's just sort of a typical foul. There's no cards involved. Everybody gets up, dust themselves off, move on. It's not, it's an absolute nothing tackle. But in the box, something as obvious, there was no malice in it. There, it was just a little bit of clumsiness, a little bit of momentum taken too far. And the Knoxville player also made the absolute most of it. You know, I'm going to go down as. Out of compassion as possible to kind of put the give the ref no choice there. 
Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think anywhere else on the field we're even clocking that tackle in any way. But no, it's it just a random foul everywhere else. Mm-hmm, right. But yeah, yeah. unfortunately, he's been, he was listening to your advice, Kate, about uh, you know making the ref call it, and he did. He did. Yeah. So. Not, not going to, you know, catch any uh, grievance ships, you know, in on that one. Uh, but Pablo came up massive, you know, on, you know, on that actual attempt. Uh, you know, d- decent attempt. You know, wouldn't say it was the greatest penalty I've ever seen, but Pablo was right on it. You know, and got you know good two hands on the ball, and for the first kicker's penalty save, and I have no idea how long, like. The only, only one I can think of. The records of, go back far. Yeah, I can think of one from like 2016, 2017 ish. Uh, there might have been one in between, but actual in-game save, like I, I, I don't know. Uh, so, I mean, not one that I want to have happen a lot because I'd rather just not give away penalties, <laughs> if at all possible. Yeah. Uh, but good to know that you know Pablo's you know there to be able to potentially step up and save. Yeah, from the spot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because we now we've seen Jaro save one in game, and we've seen Shello save one in a penalty shootout. So that's one yeah. penalty save per keeper. Which again, you don't see it too often. It's it's hard enough for the top top person. Um, so huge credit to any keeper who ends up making a save at this level, even even if the kick itself is savable height, not not all the way to the post, maybe not hit with as much power. There's kind of, there's kind of a, a, a textbook savable penalty, which is kind of the only penalty you're going to get C saved. And um, I think, I think that's what he was served up, but that doesn't mean that those are saved every time. Yeah. Yeah. Cause even then you still have to save it. There's still a lot that can go wrong with attempting it. Unfortunately, uh, they scored off directly off the rebound. Uh, and it was two yep, one. Back line was asleep. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, went back and watched it. It was uh, Sierkowski and Franca. They just got beat, you know, on the run into the box by, uh, you know, the same, you know, Tequila, whatever the guy's name is. Same guy who scored the really nice goal at City Stadium. He got in there, you know, first and was just able to slot it, you know, across you know, the face of goal. And Pablo had no chance to be able to get back up and get across in time. So, uh, unfortunately, you know, still ended up being – you know, 2-1, uh, can't fault Pablo in any way, you know, right there. You know, I think if you're, you know, a field player, you have to be able to help your keeper out, you know, in that case, and, you know, at least not let their guy have a, you know, unrestructed run straight into the ball. Yeah. I think it kind of speaks to how many people maybe expect a save to happen, that the defense is not actually crashing as hard as, might expect um but yeah still all the credit to, to pablo there we were we were chanting his name at the watch party we we think we we think we helped we think our our chance from afar cast a positive spell um I'm but pretty, unfortunately think, pretty sure you're right <laughs> didn't extend far enough to the follow-up our bad our bad we'll we'll make sure to won't stop next time that was on us we'll take the blame for that one we'll we'll keep singing all the way until the ball's out of bounds and not in the back of the we'll net just got, we've just got to and, add, add in you know the uh, you know Sierkowski song or you know songs for the other guys to inspire them to continue you know to keep going as well exactly again the powers of manifestation we, we tr- here here at kickers yeah. hq we we really believe in the powers of manifestation uh, as they impact the game of football so we we will we will acknowledge that we did not do all we could in that situation yeah. to manifest no goal off of that penalty. Yes, yes, we we weren't specific enough with our details. Exactly. Mm-hmm. We will work on it. We will be we will be better for everybody. <laughs> we will. Yes. Uh, so one other notable moment in the second half. Uh, you know, we talked about the yellow cards. You know, earlier on, I thought, you know. One of them was especially soft, you know, to Neil Vignal's, you know, midway through the you know, first half where, I don't know, it just looked like a foul to me. It didn't look like anything malicious, just one where the guy took the ball off him and it was, they kind of just got tangled. But th- that, that's one that felt to me like one of those where you might see a ref give a yellow for that in like the 80th minute, but in the 20-something minute, it's like, 
eh, come on. And that came back to bite the kickers, you know, quite hard uh, because, you know, we get, you know, late into the second half. Uh, do you have the exact minute, Kate? I think I feel like it was in like the 74, 75th, somewhere around there. Uh, um, it was the 82nd. 82nd, much later. Uh, all the stoppage time is what made it feel like it was. Yep. You know, there was so much more time with it. But, uh, yeah, ball kind of, you know, squirts free. Uh, Neil's going, in, you know, in for it. Kind of puts his studs, you know, into the you know, shin of player. I, again, I thought it was a pretty obvious yellow card. I couldn't tell who it was right away watching it live in real time. So I was, I was just hoping it was somebody who wasn't booked already at that point. Uh, but then I saw the ref pick out, go to both of his pockets, and I realized what was coming pretty quick. Yeah. I think, I think what's especially frustrating is we've already seen multiple Knoxville players put in what I think in many other situations would be given a second yellows. A lot of the Knoxville party on yellows put in. I We saw the exact same foul on kickers that was booked for in the first half that sort of just clatter across the back someone makes as they're they're driving towards goal and a player who's already on a yellow not given a second yellow for that so i think that's the most frustrating part is when the second yellows when when carded players are continuing to put in tackles throughout a game and you're not seeing the card come out I, again i think these referees i don't know if he that the eight second minute was late enough in a game that giving a red card in that situation uh, you know, is not influencing the outcome of the game in some way, like whatever sort of justifications these refs seem to be doing about the timing of their penalty calls and their uh, yellow card decisions and their second yellows and their straight. Their, it's, it's not necessarily uh, consistent play to play. And I think that's the most frustrating part is that, yeah, I'll, I'll take an, you know, if, I, yes. Do I disagree with the first yellow to an extent? I think that was very soft. Yes. And so I disagree with the, the red card, the inevitability of the red card there, but I, I, it would definitely sting a lot less if punishment was equally meted out to players on both teams. Cause there were at least three Knoxville players on yellow cards who committed fouls that could easily have been given as equal as well. So yeah. not saying we thought... want to see players sent off, but. I'm happy to see other t other teams' players sent off. I have no calls about that. Uh, and I mean, I thought you know one of them, uh, you know, what was it? What was it? Callum Johnson? Like, I thought he had one that was pretty orange cardy when he just you know absolutely you know nailed Neil. Uh, Could have been more than five minutes before Neil got sent off, you know, because he was just you know running through the midfield and it didn't look like he was playing it the was ball the too much. And that was the exact foul that Neil was booked for in the first half was coming across someone's legs as they're making a dangerous run, ostensibly the yellow being given because it's leaning towards a goal scoring opportunity. So the yellow is, you know, the, the additional layer of discipline on top of the foul itself of yeah. the simple foul and the, the goal scoring opportunity. So the fact that, you know, that standard is not applied to when Neil is driving towards goal, uh, you know, on a, I think it was like a three v two situation, all and him being fouled does not deem to be yellow card worthy. I I take issue with that. I I'll say it. I think the refereeing in this is astonishingly in this league is astonishingly incons astonishingly inconsistent. And um, yeah, it's it's not necessarily always the actions themselves; it's the inconsistency that I think. Mm. I don't think there's a, a fan in this league who does not feel like their team has been unfairly impacted by inconsistent refereeing. Yeah. Well, I'm choosing to, you know, look at the silver lining in this and that Neil will get a week to rest his body from, you know, getting hacked all over the place, uh, you know, next week and we'll be able to come back, you know, strong, you know, the following week because I worry for him and I worry for Adrian just with the amount of punishment those guys take, you know, game in and game out. So a nice rest game. Can be okay, and I mostly say this because the kickers held on. If they hadn't, yep. I would probably have other opinions on this. But at this point, uh, you know, Darren, uh, understandably, you know, went you know full defense mode. Out comes Bill Hart and goes Ani. Uh, it's just set up shop, and yeah, I think for the most part, you know, the kickers were able to you know, see out 
in the majority of the half. You know, I felt like Knoxville, they had a couple of headers that you know, kind of went across, you know, the frame of goal, but didn't actually you know, go on target. One where Pablo comes across and, you know, has a nice little collision with the post. Uh, slightly concerning moment. Uh, but I'll, part of me wonders if he was just uh, using some clock right there as well. But uh, honesty is not always the best policy. Well, it's not dishonesty. I'm sure it hurt running into the post. Like, I'm, we thought we were calling for an ambulance. Luckily, he was fine. Yeah. But uh, what, what were your thoughts those last you know, 10, 15 minutes when you had in the stoppage time? Uh, did you feel the kickers were going to be able to see it through? Were you worried that, oh, crap, here's a, you know, it's going to happen? Where's your head at? Uh, it was, it was, I would say the most positive place only because we've seen an additional defense substitution go horribly awry on multiple occasions, especially since when you add an additional defender, sometimes you end up missing your marks. People, the players end up losing their marks. The, they don't reorganize quickly enough. There's sort of that two or three minutes right after a substitution that can be a little bit chaotic for the team that just made the change, especially if they are um, sitting back on the defensive that you, you need to keep up your sort of man marking, figuring out who has who um, we've seen the kickers. I think just a few weeks ago, a goal conceded right, right after a defensive substitution um, because the defense did not reorganize the, the man marking was not, everyone did not know who they were marking. So We've seen a defensive substitution late on under a lot of pressure go very, very wrong. So not extremely positive. I think I think they they managed it well. I think possibly that this was just an addition to the back line rather than a swap, a straight swap. Um, a player who was in a more attacking role was taken out and an additional player was added to the back line. So I think that uh, alleviated maybe some of that chaos that can sometimes happen. Uh, but I would not I, – I think – they managed, they managed the pressure very well. There weren't too many um, dangerous opportunities. But based on their track record, I, I was not in a um, particularly positive headspace. Um, yeah. But they they showed they showed they defended a lot better um, than they have in the, past, in the sort of last scramble of a game. Yeah, Pablo did have to make one more, I think, decent save. On, on replay, I think it was a lot more routine than uh, it looked like in real time. Uh, and I think somebody might have been behind him to help clear the ball out too, if you know he had missed it. Uh, but other than that, you know he didn't have too much to do. I do think that, you know the team adding defenders in to hold a lead, you know, just did make a difference. Like they were not going to let you know a guy you know be able to run in behind this time, like you know against Chattanooga, like against you know Greenville. If you know somebody was going to really have to you know hit a good shot to be able to you know beat them, and didn't happen. So the kickers, you know, get out of Knoxville. With three points still have never lost to one Knoxville uh, in the well two years of Knoxville's existence so far, but undefeated is undefeated. Uh, and, you know, keeping that streak going, uh, Knoxville had their fancy red Panda, you know, shirts and everything. Uh, leave wearing the red to the pros. Y'all go back to your sunset and all that other nonsense that you like to be able to wear. Pandas aren't even yeah. a real bear. They're more closely related to raccoons and weasels. So, I mean, it's Knoxville. <laughs> That's all we'll say on that. Yeah. For more questions, reference, uh, you know, star player for the Ivy. See what her thoughts on Knox Knoxville are. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, big win you know, for the kickers, not just because. All wins are big wins, uh, but yeah, the league is heating up a little bit now. So that win uh, keeps the kickers current as of Sunday night in eighth place in the league on eight points, so up to one point per game in the league. Uh, but there's a lot of competition you know, coming because Northern Colorado went into Omaha, beat them in Omaha. Chattanooga went to you know, Greenville, beat you know, Greenville. Uh, so those two teams are right behind the kickers in the standings with games in hand. Uh, you know, Spokane is, you know, Charlotte are just above the kickers. 
you know, right now with uh, 10 and 11 points respectively, same with Tormenta. So uh, getting these points, starting to you know, be able to get positive results on the regular, it's going to be, you know, paramount uh you know to it being a pleasant summer moving forward yes and yeah obviously it's nice to see team chemistry continue to coalesce um so far though still the same goal scorers that we've seen so no new goal scorers have been added to the league goal scoring tally which diversity in goal scorers is usually pretty important to Hold wins on. According to the league, Sean Lewis is a new goal scorer for us now. Who is? Sean, Sean Lewis? Lewis? That is true. That is true. We'll take it where we can get. But unfortunately, he only makes an appearance for the kickers twice a year. So not, not as reliable as some of the ones we employ on a week-to-week -week basis. Um, but one thing that I did appreciate is despite, you know, I mentioned earlier the possession numbers, it did, it did feel that the kickers were very productive in possession. So I didn't necessarily feel um, I didn't feel that possession gap. I didn't think that we were sitting back absorbing pressure for most of the game, because I think whenever they got on the ball, they were very forward looking. They played the ball quickly. They moved up the field with, with purpose. Um, so it made for a much more enjoyable watch as well, which, um, you always makes an away day easier. Um, so yeah, I was, I was impressed with just the actual quality of the kickers performance sort of top to bottom. It would have been nice to score a goal in the second half as well to not just rely on sort of a flurry inside the first 20 minutes and then defend that lead. But um, yeah, I think eventually, hopefully we'll have, we'll have that, we'll have that ability to add a third goal to keep that, to keep the lead. Um not not coming into a teetering last 15 20 hoping that we can eke out the points exactly exactly well kickers are back at it saturday the 8th at city stadium uh they'll be playing charlotte and uh another jaeger cup you know game so uh we're in the same group with them so potentially a uh big six pointer you know there or i guess i guess that you know with the penalties that they're all become six pointers in one way, shape, or form, just depends how they're distributed. Uh, Charlotte, they've won once in two months. I didn't realize that had been that dire for them recently. Tons of draws along the way, including you know a one-one draw against you know, Tormenta this last weekend. But uh, you know our first look at this year's Charlotte team. You know, uh, old friend Hugh Roberts back there. Uh, Carlton Belmar now down in Charlotte as well. Uh, Carl Belmar, who missed his penalty in you know, their Jaeger shootout last time around. Uh, but you know, some familiar faces coming back to City Stadium. Uh, okay, what are you, you know, hoping to you know, be able to see out of the team next week as we move back into cup play? I'd love to see someone who's not Adrian Bilhart or Chandler O'Dwyer score a goal. Or Maxi Schenfeld, I guess, but he seems to only score the spectacular. Um, which would be great. We take the spectacular. Uh, but that, I think, at a minimum, it would be great. And obviously, Neil won't be there. So Neil has um, not gotten on the League One score sheet yet. Um, but he has been a reliable goal scorer for us in the past. Um, so obviously, hopefully, we'll be working around his absence. Um, but it would be nice for someone other than those three names to be on the score sheet. It would show that we can get goals from, from other places that other players – can be getting in positions where they they are able to score, um, that people have the confidence to take shots, um, put the shots on frame. Yeah, I unfortunately will not be at the game on Sunday on Saturday because I will be at a horn concert uh, in Bristow. So apologies in advance um, to everyone who is oh, so excited to see me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I will be seeing. Okay, the team will have the team person. will have no direction now. I know, I know. I'm so, I'm I'm gutted, really. But I I hope I don't miss another penalty shootout because we seem I'll to be winning those. Yeah, <laughs> true. And maybe like four or five goals. Let's get those goal differential numbers up. Let's take a leaf out of the Ivy's book and actually score more than two goals in a game. I'm on board with that idea. I like it. Well, cool. Well, yeah, I think you know next week the question is going to be you know who fills in you know the Neil Vignoles you know, shoes because he's been ever present 
you know, uh, you know so far this year. And I'm not not really sure who the natural you know, kind of you know understudy for him is on this team. So I think that'll be interesting to be able to see. You know, do we see Ryan Shello you know become the Jaeger Cup keeper again now that you know it looks like Pablo's back in league favor? A lot of questions abound. Uh, but yeah, hope you know to be able to see everybody out there next week. You know, there's been a lot of you know good momentum you know, building at City Stadium across uh, all the teams you know that play there. You know, let's keep it up. You know, and keep it going. And you know, hopefully, we'll see some of these road successes coming back to City Stadium. So, well, thank you everybody for listening. Uh, please give us you know uh, you know a follow on. Uh, whichever the you know platforms you're listening to, you know social medias, you know uh, River City ninety three, pretty much everywhere. Let us know what you like. Let us know what you like to you know hear us talk more about. Happy to be able to crowdsource uh, all of our content. You know, you let us know what you want to hear about. We'll find a way to get it. Well, we might find a way to get it done. I'm not going to say we will. Because if we remember. Um, yeah, we don't we don't get paid enough to you know give promises on this. Uh, but appreciate everybody you know giving us a listen. Uh said it last week. This was fun. Let's do it again next week. And look forward to talking with all of you about uh, a third a third successive win next time out. Thanks everyone. Yes. Bye. <laughs>